comes at the end of a seven-year cycle. It's how the EU plots its spending, and it's known as the multi-annual financial framework. The problem is that promises of spending, also known as commitments, sometimes get rolled over year on year until they pile up and need to be paid. And that's what the Commission says has happened this year. So how does the 2013 budget actually break down? What's the money for? The category known as sustainable growth gets the bulk of it, with an increase of 13% on last year. That includes money to invest in Europe's poorer regions, as well as for European research and innovation programmes. And this is where the biggest increase is being proposed at 17.8%. Agriculture and rural development, known as natural resource management in Eurospeak, still gets a hefty chunk. Controversially for some, farming aid goes up by 5% on last year. The category of administration covers the spending of the EU institutions and all its agencies. Overall, this sees a 3.2% increase on 2012. In the EU's external relations, its new foreign service, as well as development and humanitarian aid, there's a rise of 5.1%. That also covers things like democracy building in neighbouring countries. And finally, when it comes to so-called citizenship, security and justice, which would also include policing the EU's external borders, the Commission says more money is also needed. There's an 11.1% rise in spending on security, but so-called citizenship seems to be the only policy area where a real cut is being proposed. These plans now go to the politicians to fight over and eventually agree. Europe's governments and the Council of Ministers will share the power here with members of the European Parliament who under Lisbon now have an equal say on the EU's annual spending. They're expected to reach a deal by the end of the year. But getting agreement won't be easy. If past years are anything to go by, the negotiations are likely to be long and torturous. Representatives from all three of the EU's main institutions here at the European Commission, over there from the Council of Ministers and the European Parliament will have to slug it out in meetings known as trilogues and conciliations. In the case of the European Parliament, armed with its new powers under Lisbon, there will be negotiators from its budget committee, as well as representatives from the main political groups there, and of course its president. Now, every single one of the national governments, 27 of them, will be represented as well in the form of ministers, officials and EU ambassadors permanently based here in Brussels. And because national governments don't have a veto when it comes to annual spending plans, the importance of finding consensus and making friends will be paramount. The debate on Budget 2013 has already started and it's clear there are strong opposing views. The Commission President has already insisted it's a budget for growth. His Budget Commissioner says it's an anti-crisis package. But from the UK, Mark Hoban called it unacceptable. That was echoed by his Dutch counterpart. Inconceivable, he said. And from the European Parliament, the leader of the UK Conservatives called the budget plans outlandish. But the MEP, who will be leading the Parliament's team for the budget, says he wants more Europe. And his socialist colleague said this was a defensive budget. She wants more money in the pot. Some reactions so far to the 2013 budget. And as we said, there'll be many technical and political discussions to follow over the coming months. But as much as anything else, this is going to be a public relations war. And I'm joined now here in the studio by two people who are very much in the business of communicating the EU, albeit from rather different sides. Uh, we have Dan Hannan, who is a Eurosceptic blogger, also a British Conservative MEP at the European Parliament. Uh, we have Patrizio Fiorelli, who I think it's fair to, to say is the spin doctor for the Budget Commissioner, uh, Janusz Lewandowski. Uh, I don't know whether you're in the business of spin, uh, but so far, some would say, Patrizio, um, you haven't done a terribly good job. If you look at the reaction there to this 6.8% budget, it's not terribly positive. 
Well, I think there are two elements to uh, offences. The first one is, of course, those who oppose are always louder than those who don't. And um, we have seen that from a vast majority of member states, there hasn't been any reaction saying this is too much. On the contrary, some of them have told us we need more because we still have EU-funded projects to, to pay for. Who the wants second more, one, then? Well, you have countries like, um, first of all, Central and Eastern Europe, we're still mm -hmm. talking about 12, 15 of those countries, um, that are in the process of really starting the infrastructure from scratch after mm -hmm. half a century almost of communism. And then you have another group of countries, um, of which we hear virtually every day, Greece, Spain, Italy, Portugal. Those countries have already paid for EU-funded projects, and now they expect the EU to pay back, which is right enough, um, and by not increasing the budget, we would make things worse for them, for their And treasury. this is an important point, Dan Hannan, that the debate sometimes is cast as if it is the Commission mm -hmm. wanting to spend lots more money and national governments struggling hard to keep austerity and being asked to put more in the pot, and that really isn't how it is. Well, I mean, of course, there are some countries that are getting net contributions out of the EU. I'm bound to say it doesn't seem to be doing them much good. I mean, if, if, if subsidies from Brussels were the way to prosperity, Greece would now be the wealthiest country in Europe. It's, it's precisely because of this uh, increasing dependence on external subventions that they've lost competitiveness and productivity. But I think that in every country, there is a sense that individuals and businesses are having to make cutbacks. You know, uh, in Britain, my constituents, you know, in every family, they're saying, do, do, do we need a, a second car? Can we find a cheaper mobile phone provider and so on? When they then read that, you know, our net contribution to the Brussels budget in 2010 went up by 74%, when they see these billions uh, being handed over, when we're making very difficult cuts at home, and this isn't just Britain, all 27 member states are struggling to make domestic cuts and are seeing every euro they save squandered by these constantly rising uh, Brussels budgets, I think there is a sense that it's, it's un unreasonable and unfair for the EU to, to preach austerity to the member states while not applying it to itself. And that's the public perception, isn't it? You would have thought that the clear uh, lack of appetite for austerity, which exists in uh, most member states, nobody wants to be suffering in this way, might translate itself into uh, the idea of a sort of growth budget from Brussels. It doesn't, though. It, what it looks like to lots of people is a kind of hypocrisy, actually, asking... Uh, uh, us all to save, but then uh, suggesting uh, more money for the EU budget. That's what Dan's saying, essentially. But that's not the case. If you look at the um, conclusions of all the recent European councils, the um, heads of states and government from 27 countries keep on telling us austerity alone will not get us out of the crisis. We need a blend of austerity and investment for growth, for job-friendly growth. And the, the, the difference with the EU budget is that about 80% of the EU budget is what I would call compulsory expenses. You know, in a, in a sort of don't shoot the messenger case, that if there are direct payments to farmers, it's because member states agreed there would be. The Commission cannot change that rule. It's like the policeman having to enforce the rule, but not making it. If we receive uh, like 40 billion euros worth of bills from member states, uh, incidentally, when you say it makes no good, I would like to just tell you that about 40% of all public investment in Central and Eastern Europe depends on EU funds and for Greece, Spain, Italy and Portugal. Why not go 20%. all the way? Make it 100%. They'd be the richest um, countries in the world. So I think that the, the problem we have here is, if you, in, in simple terms, the, the monthly bill for the credit card has arrived. It's too late to whinge about it. It means that money has been engaged. Now, we have a duty as a Commission to get from member states' estimates themselves how much they will need next year for their projects. And we have to trust them and say, well, we just add up. It's a mechanical exercise. And you find it's 7%. But believe me, it's not something you do with a smile, thinking, let's do 7%. When you we were aware of it beforehand, saying, there is a crisis, and we ask for 7% increase. But you think it's very difficult to find out of 80, 85 percent of compulsory expenses, savings, because we haven't got the right to change the rules for this. It's not well, the role of the unlimited budget. Let me suggest a couple of low-hanging ones that you could do, Patrizio. Um, the European, the House of European History, at 130 million pounds. Why, why is the European? Uh, union running museums. You and your fellow communications officers, £80 million pounds per year. The, the EU's general publicity and, uh, and advertising budget, bigger than Coca-Cola's. You know, even if 
uh, even if we accept that you know the, the EU is spending its money wisely and well, I have to stand back and question the premise here, which is that you're investing for growth. Any, by definition, any euro that you are investing, you've had to take from somewhere else. You've transferred it from the private sector into the public sector. This isn't money that's coming from another planet. So what we're really doing when we talk about the EU investing for growth, when we talk about the EU spending more, is tax bills going up, either immediately or in, in a deferred way through borrowing, so that we expand the bureaucracy of the EU and the surrounding bureaucracies that administer its programmes. Now, that's very good news if you are working in the bureaucracy, but I'm afraid that the, the record to date, if you look at what's happening around Europe, suggests that it is not very good in terms of bolstering growth in the recipient countries. There are two points there to try and pick up on. I mean, first of all, this issue about saving. I mean, your point and the, that of the Commissioner has been we have to pay bills that member states committed us to. Okay, that, I think you accept that, don't you, Dan, that there are bills that need to be paid. But the point is, why can't you find savings elsewhere in order to pay those bills? And if you look at the budget, there are increases in areas, that, perhaps those that Dan's mentioned, but also, for example, administration, there's a 3.2% increase in that. Why, why are you increasing this area? There's only one real cut in the whole of the budget, and that's in citizenship. Uh, so why aren't you finding the savings? And then we'll get on to that issue about whether you're really investing in growth. Mm. We've made an effort to find savings, really. Um, Commissioner Lewandowski himself, with his history of fighting communism, centralization, bureaucracy in Poland for most of his life, is probably the last person on earth who would like to go, just let's expand bureaucracy. But again, it's very easy to criticize. When you start scratching on the surface, as we have to do, then you find the reasons. We have made savings. For instance, we have asked every service of the, the Commission to check all the programs, all the projects are running and say if any of those projects is not performing without good justification, we're going to cut. And we've done that for hundreds of millions of euros when you add up every little bit here. 